Welcome to this rapid review on real exchange rates. So the first thing to notice about real exchange rates is that we denote them with this symbol epsilon, as opposed to the lowercase e for a nominal exchange rate. And there's a lot of different ways of defining real exchange rate that are all equivalent. They're all different ways of saying the same thing. I think an easy way to think of it would be that the real exchange rate is, it's a measure of how much stuff you can buy in one country versus another with the same amount of money. So an intuitive definition is the one we have here. It's the amount of stuff you can buy in a foreign country with E dollars. So if you took one dollar, converted it at the nominal exchange rate, you'd have E dollars, and then you'd see how much stuff you could buy. And you'd divide that by the amount of stuff you can buy in the U.S. with the one dollar. So it compares how much you can buy with the dollar after converting it overseas versus what you can buy in the U.S. And given that equation, sort of natural way to interpret it is that if epsilon is bigger than 1, your real exchange rate is bigger than 1, then it means the amount you can buy overseas is bigger than the amount you can buy in the U.S., which means that stuff overseas must be cheap. So if epsilon is bigger than 1, stuff is cheap overseas, and you're going to want to buy that overseas stuff. You'll want to travel overseas for vacation. You'll want to import things from overseas because they're cheap. If epsilon is less than 1, on the other hand, it means the amount you can buy overseas is less than what you could get with a dollar in America, so you're probably not going to want to import much stuff. You're not going to want to travel overseas. Things are expensive overseas. So now that we can interpret epsilon after we you know, get a number for it, we have a definition for it, we can interpret whether it's big or small and what that means, what we'd like to do is derive a formula for it. And there's a lot of ways to do this, so I'll just sort of work it out. And I think you should do this as an exercise at home is, uh, you know, pause the video and see if you can sort of work out what would be a definite uh, formula for real exchange rate. But I'll just give it to you. It's the nominal exchange rate times the price of stuff in the U.S. over the price of stuff overseas. So as stuff in the U.S. becomes more expensive, the, uh, the exchange rate real exchange rate goes up, that makes sense. As the prices in the US go up, uh, things are cheaper, relatively cheaper overseas. And um, it has an inverse relationship with P star for sort of the, you know, it's the same logic. And as the nominal exchange rate goes up, of course, the, the real exchange rate goes up. So they're connected to each other, but the real exchange rate has factored in these prices, P and P star, where uh, I guess I should make a note of that. P star is the foreign price level. All right, so now that we've got some definitions out of the way, let's uh, talk about theories of real exchange rates. So the simplest theory of real exchange rates is so-called purchasing power parity. And um, it's probably not the best theory, but it's simple, so it has that virtue. So purchasing power parity is the theory that the real exchange rate should be approximately one uh, the purchasing power in any country should be about one. Things should cost about the same in every country due to the so-called law of one price. So the idea is that you can't really have different prices for different things in different places because if there were places where, you know, say gasoline was cheap and other places where it was expensive, what will happen is people will always go and buy from the cheap place, ship the gasoline to where it's expensive, sell it at those higher prices, and make a profit. And this process of buying all the cheap stuff and then reselling it at high prices will cause prices to go up where it's cheap and prices to go down where it's more expensive. So it'll, it'll eliminate all those deviations. So let's go ahead and uh, evaluate PPP based on some data. So I've gathered this is like pretty realistic data on the prices of beer in different places. So we have Beijing where the price is 10 RMB. <laughs> so this, uh, these columns here list uh, the US price P here, which is always going to be a buck fifty, and then we have the local price in the column next to that, the exchange rate in the column next to that, and we can use this data P, P star, and E to calculate the real exchange rate, and we'll see whether beer is more expensive overseas or less expensive overseas. So, for the first example with Beijing, we'd multiply E times P, so that's a buck fifty times seven, and then divide by ten, and that works out to be just a little bit over one. It's like one point oh five. So since epsilon is bigger than 1, it means beer is just very, very slightly cheaper in Beijing than in the U.S. Uh, this is actually Boston prices, not just U.S. prices. All right, so then the next example is Paris. In Paris, a beer costs about 1 euro, and the exchange rate is 0.9 euros per dollar. So if we plug that into our formula, 
uh, we get, it turns out, about 1.35. And we could imagine gathering more and more data from more countries and calculating real exchange rates based on beer. And what we find is these countries are actually fairly typical. Um, the, the real exchange rate with a basket of beer is never too far away from one, so purchasing power theory is not like a horrible theory, but there are plenty of significant deviations like with Paris where the real exchange rate is 1.35 or in some cases 1.5, 1.6, which is, you know, not really that close to one. So the overall conclusion we'd have is that PPP is an okay theory. A lot of the time the values are pretty close to one, but they often deviate substantially, so it's not a, it's not a perfect theory. And the rule of thumb that you should know is that traded goods, uh, specifically goods that are easy to ship, easy to trade, uh, tend to have, uh, PPP tends to predict their price as well. They tend to be similar everywhere. But non-traded goods, uh, especially services like haircuts, which you can't you know, transport, you can't ship from place to place, are going to have very different prices in different parts of the world. So PPP works well for traded goods, but not well for non-traded goods. <laughs> Thanks for watching this rapid review on the definition of real exchange rates and a first simple theory purchasing power parity. Uh, thanks for watching.